Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin. You're watching The Digital Age. Our show tonight comes to you from the television studios of the Columbia University School of Journalism. And with us is Frank Wisner. Frank Wisner has had a distinguished career as a United States ambassador, spanned four decades, eight presidents. He's been ambassador to Egypt, ambassador to India, and probably ambassador to a number of other countries I can't remember. Uh, but we want to talk about the situation in the Middle East since September 11th and the attack on the consulate in Libya. And uh, he is here to uh, enlighten us about uh, what the issues are. Uh, Frank, welcome. welcome. Thank you, back. Jim. Now, Thank you. Now, I, uh, first, uh, what a grievous loss it is to all of us that uh, Chris Stevens, our ambassador in, in Libya, died at the consulate in Benghazi in the line of duty. Uh, what should we be doing to protect our diplomats, and, and what accounts for this uh, terrible tragedy? Well, you're right to begin with the loss of Chris Stevens and three other very brave Americans who lost their lives in the attack on the Consulate General in Benghazi. Um, it is a crushing event. But it shouldn't deter us from the fact that the United States has real and important interests in the Middle East. And it's got to defend them, and it can't defend them from thousands of miles away. We have to be on the ground in the nations of the Middle East and any American diplomat, and I've been one of them in the past, my son is one today, knows when you accept the obligation to go and represent the United States, you're stepping into harm's way. It's a risk you take, and you take willingly. You also assume that there will be proper protection, which is the point you asked. Yes, we owe our diplomats the best security that you can get, but at the end of the day, security for diplomats is provided by the host country. The host country is obliged by the Vienna Convention and other international understandings and traditional diplomatic usage to defend diplomats who are sent as guests of their country. Our does that principle apply in a country like Libya, where, which is uh, newly born? and where there appears to be uh, little control uh, over the rest of the country uh, from uh, the capital in Tripoli. The principle applies. It is, cannot be carried out perfectly in a revolutionary environment like Libya, and there the risk factor comes in. You have to take a risk if you're going to be present where the action's at, where the decisions in Libya is at. But much depends on a, the defense of an embassy depends on your relations with the government with which you're dealing or the country in which you're working. So we have to look very carefully at the quality of our relationships as the first line of defense. Well, let's, see, let's talk about the quality of our relationships. Uh, I mean, what do you think uh, gave rise to, uh, to this violence, this wave of violence uh, across uh, Muslim countries? Uh, uh, not only in the Middle East, but also uh, Indonesia. Uh, and uh, is there uh, some root cause for all this anti-Americanism? Certainly it's more than a 14-minute trailer film that's been on the Internet for six months. Well, that's certainly one factor. Uh, the Muslim world is highly sensitive to insults to the prophet and to the religion. Uh, much is our own civilizations would have reacted in the most hostile manner 150 years ago. But that's not the only reason. The ugly film, the, that terrible, terrible bit of footage uh, isn't the only reason. There are other reasons. You have to be careful and remember that the United States has been on the point in the Middle East. We invaded Iraq. We've been at war in Afghanistan. We have been seen by many in the Middle East not to have backed a just cause, the Palestinians. Uh, there is a sense of a, grieve, a grievance against America. But I think I'd add to this, there is a degree of malign intent as well. The testimony this week in Washington points to the fact 
that there were those who used September 11th as a moment to attack an American establishment. Uh, the responsibility of clandestine groups, including the possibility of Al-Qaeda, is clearly right there. Uh, attack the United States is also a way of attacking those emerging in power in the region. In Egypt, for example, where demonstrations have taken place in Cairo, it's clear to me that the extremist Salafis are using the American embassy as a place to attack in order to embarrass a Muslim Brotherhood-led government. What are the Salafis? How do they differ from Al-Qaeda? Uh, the Salafis are a diffuse movement. Al-Qaeda is a controlled network. Uh, the Salafis is a broad description of religious fundamentalists who believe going back to the purest forms of Islam is the right way in dress and practice and code, the strong rejection of other religions, traditions that are alien to the mainstream of Islam over the centuries. Uh, now, the White House uh, has branded this as a terrorist attack, not a, uh, the attack of an unruly mob in response to a film, but a terrorist attack and has even suggested one of the ringleaders was uh, someone who was released from Guantanamo, who was an associate of Osama bin Laden. I mean, doesn't the footprint of uh, al-Qaeda uh, arise brilliantly in, in, the, uh, uh, in the consulate at Benghazi? I can't rule that out. And of course, the White House or the United States government testimony to the Hill has asserted the case. But that's not an adequate answer for Egypt, nor for Sudan, nor for Yemen, nor for Pakistan, nor for Indonesia. Um, you can't put, so I, the point I think I'm trying to make is there are many causes for this recent outburst. But whatever the cause is, and however dangerous it appears, that does not mean the United States should back away and leave the region and abandon the political principles and the political position that we need to defend. We have interests at stake. We've got to be in that region. Now, uh, the New York Times editorially said that the film, the 14-minute film, was a convenient fuse for rage. And the rage is just uh, run riot. I mean, for kids in Pakistan, they're saying death to America. I mean, they don't even know what they're talking about. Uh, I mean, how do you explain this? I mean, it's almost a cancer of hatred. Well, you can build up a head of steam in many countries in the Muslim world around symbolic issues like this film. Uh, but at the same time, let me be very careful and say I don't think it is a full answer to the violence that you've seen. It doesn't answer the Al-Qaeda problem. It doesn't answer the internal uh, political wrestling match that occurs in Egypt. We have to have a broad view of what's going on. But it means that whatever it means, it means the United States does not lose its focus or the need to be represented in the region. Protect your diplomats, yes, but make sure you've got them on the ground. Do you uh, fault the, the Libyans and or the State Department uh, for not protecting uh, Ambassador Stevens to a greater degree? I mean. Uh, there had been months of sporadic attacks on that consulate in Benghazi. Uh, uh, we certainly had every, uh, had every reason to believe that uh, there might be a serious attack on the anniversary of uh, September 11th. Well, there's a detailed description of the events surrounding in this morning's New York Times, and it's yeah. rather compelling, supports the contention you're making that there were a number of earlier signals. There usually are after an event has taken place. Uh, but let me argue that we'll get to the facts. The State Department has called for a very careful review of both the embassy's security and the intelligence reading that took place. We'll know what the facts were. But facts are there. We are a cautious people about our diplomats. We don't just throw them in harm's way. We are cautious in how they're protected. We're cautious in how they're used once they're on the ground. We can always do a better job, but that doesn't mean you give up trying to do the job. We need to get our diplomats who've been, in many cases, evacuated back to, their, back to work again. And that has to be done as soon as possible 
Otherwise, we can't read what's going on in these societies. We cannot understand what the impulse is. We can't give Washington the advice it needs to shape our policies. You spoke of your son who was uh, posted to our embassy in the Sudan in Khartoum. He was there on September 11. Uh, his uh, wife lived nearby uh, in their home, and uh, he happened to be at the office when uh, everything broke loose. Uh, what was his experience? His wife of barely 10 days. Wife of 10 days. Uh, yes, his experience was very harsh. He, uh, there was automatic weapons fire right around him, burning consular facility. Uh, he went through a rough time, but he's the first one to say to you, and he'd say it to you, Jim, today and to all your viewers, we knew when we joined the Foreign Service what risks we were taking. We took them with our eyes open, and we took them in order to serve. And as he's made it clear to me, Dad, I want to go back and continue to do my job. Well, it's marvelous, and it's marvelous he continues the family tradition of public service. Thanks. He must be very proud of him. Thanks. And we're all relieved. He's now, me and his wife have now been evacuated to, uh, to Greece, which uh, is perhaps a, a friendlier environment. Uh, let just uh, moving on. Of course, uh, uh, our president uh, elaborated uh, what's been known as the Cairo Doctrine, where he was said to have uh, reached out his hand to uh, friendship to uh, to Muslims. Uh, does all this set him back in that policy, in your judgment? I mean, is this liable to die down after uh, a few more weeks, or is this going to be a a thorn in the side of uh, both sides at achieving a constructive relationship? Well, I think there are three ways of answering this problem. One is to uh, back out of the Middle East to say, well, we gave it a good try. The president gave a speech, reached out his hand. That hand was bitten. Let's, why do we need him? Why don't we come home? Why don't we save the money? Uh, Others One congressman might say, said, let's withdraw aid from let, Pakistan, Egypt, some, and, some people uh, say, and Libya. Many people say foolish things. Yes. Uh, others might say, let's strike back and, and retaliate. Um, I think the third answer is the one that makes the most sense, and that is y this set of events reminds you you've got to engage. You've got to be there. You've got to understand. You have to be able to maneuver. You have to have people on the ground. You have to have policies that are appropriate. You have to build relationships with countries and societies, and therefore, the impulse that caused the president to speak as he did in Cairo and the words he chose are as true today as the day he delivered them. We need to follow through, not back off, but follow through and make it clear through our actions that we are in the Muslim world as a legitimate player, but as a friend and a constructive force. We have a job to do protecting our own interests but we can operate for the greater good of the community. Well, at the memorial service uh, for Chris Stevens, uh, Deputy Secretary of State uh, Bill Burns uh, said, uh, what matters most is what you see is happening in the days ahead. Uh, now, what matters most is what you see is happening in the days ahead. How do you see uh, the situation is playing out? Well, these incidents, this September 11th, usually sort of spike and then recede a bit, but they will spike again. We are in an age of revolutionary change throughout the Arab world and to a larger degree in many areas of the Muslim world. So there are going to be moments of volatility, but the question is not whether you're faced with volatility, but what are your policies? What is your strategy and how do you stick with it? And I argue again, Jim, with you, that we must be involved and engaged to protect ourselves, to inform ourselves, to be able to influence events. You've got to be there on the ground and engaged. Well, we're in a period of change, not revolutionary change, uh, in America in that we're in the midst of a political campaign. And uh, conservative uh, columnist uh, Pat Buchanan says that uh, this whole thing happened because our foreign policy is naive. And uh, Governor Romney has attacked the president uh, for being weak and ineffectual. And he said, that's why this has happened. Uh, do you credit any of these arguments that uh, 
our foreign policy has been weak, and that's why we've been so vulnerable. Well, I served for 37 some years as a diplomat of the United States, and I served presidents of both parties. And I just can't bring myself to roll my sleeves up and get involved in a partisan debate, mm -hmm. not even today and <laughs> even though I'm retired. That said, um, while I can understand the compulsions of an electoral season, I find as a general matter the behavior of the United States over these decades with a range of maneuver of a couple of percentage points both ways has been pretty constant. That we've recognized our interests lie in assuring the world's economy stability, and the flow of energy, the safety and security of the state of Israel, and the position of the United States on a really geostrategic piece of territory, the Middle East. These interests are constant, and presidents come back to them. In order to be able to practice them, we have to have relationships with the people of the area. We have to engage with those people and their leaders. These constants call us back again. So I'll stay out of the partisan mud throwing, but I will stay on the side of the United States being involved in its own interests. Uh, let's look for a moment at the Saudis, uh, because it's interesting that the Saudis, who are supporting the revolutionaries <coughs> in, in Syria, uh, while uh, the, the Syrian government appears to uh, be supported by the Iranian, uh, the Saudis uh, are not so upset by uh, this film, and, uh, and they haven't had the, the wave of uprisings against America that you've had in other Arab countries. Uh, how do you explain that? Well, I think the Saudis are a really, <clears throat> they're a long-standing friend of the United States. And the Saudi government recognizes that friendship and has the means at its disposal to maintain law and order and not let uh, subversive elements, as was the case in Benghazi, uh, take advantage of a situation like this or allow, you know, the inflamed passions of a mob or uh, breakout. <clears throat> that said, Saudi Arabia is right on the front line, and we recognize that. It's sitting there across the Gulf from Iran. It's facing Iran indirectly through proxies, as you pointed out in Syria. Uh, the Saudis and we have a great deal in common. Saudi Arabia's behavior and the way it associates itself with the new regimes emerging in the course of this Arab awakening, also very important to the United States. This is a time to strengthen our relationship with Riyadh, to strengthen our ties, to listen carefully to the Saudis and to consult closely, and take actions of a common nature whenever possible with them. Now, uh, let's move on to our old friend Egypt. Uh, in uh, Egypt, they have a new uh, ruler, a uh, new president, uh, leader, his name is Morsi. Uh, Morsi at first attacked the film, and then he thought better of it, and he attacked the violence. Uh, you know, how do you, uh, Egypt is in population the largest Arab country. I mean, how do you see uh, that evolving? Well, it, I think the Egyptians were taken somewhat by surprise, uh, <clears throat> as you can be pretty certain the Salafis in Egypt saw a terrific opportunity mm. in this film uh, to be able to embarrass the government. Uh, but once the government took stock of its position and the new Muslim Brotherhood-led government reflected on Egypt, her interests, her place in the world, the importance of the United States relationship, it has both protected our mission and the president has come out four square Morsi, President Morsi has come out four square in defense of the principle that no violence of this sort is permissible in a modern civilized society. So I, I think it's the, event, the events have served to remind us that Egypt is emerging from a time of chaos, of politicking with a new regime, and this regime is beginning to act like a state and act with the responsibility of a state. That's where we want it to be. 
That's the Egypt we can be associated with. That's the Egypt that will play its own very special role in maintaining the balance of power in the Middle East. You think they'll honor the peace treaty with Israel? I think it, it's so very much in Egypt's interest that the treaty survive. I can't say that there won't be some interest in seeing the treaty adjusted to meet present circumstances, and there are many reasons to look at uh, features of the treaty. For example, uh, the ability of Egypt to secure the Sinai from which violence has occurred across the border into Israel, but as violence has occurred against Egyptians. While you can look at aspects of it, the keeping the peace with Israel, not allowing Egypt and Israel to drift back into the uh, pre-Sadat period of violent confrontation, the pre-73, 1973 war period, I, I see compelling logic that Egypt will live with that and an overwhelming sentiment on the part of Egyptians. They don't want a war with Israel. They may not agree with Israel, they may have real differences, and it may provoke, Israel may provoke great anger, but they don't want to go back to a war cycle again. What is your analysis of these new, uh, hopefully more moderate uh, uh, leaders in the Arab world as a result of the Arab Spring? Aren't they kind of caught in a cross current between uh, what's in the best interest of the country, which is uh, an engagement and relationship with the United States? and the political need to satisfy their Islamist adherents uh, who might demand a, a yeah, harder line? That's a really good question. I would argue that 18 months after the beginning of the Arab awakening and this revolutionary tide, we still don't know where it's going to end. It's going to take years to play out. Is it going to be more or less democratic? Is it going to be more or less peaceful? Is it going to be more or less tolerant in religious terms? Is it going to be more or less open economically in free market terms? Uh, we, we're still watching this play out. It's very wrong to jump to conclusions. Where newly empowered Muslim uh, traditional groups like the Muslim Brothers in Egypt and, and Nahda in Tunisia have moved to the fore, they have shown a recognition that they have a responsibility to preserve the integrity of their states, the well-being of their people, and seek those friendships internationally that give the region stability and give their countries some promise. On those core understandings, we can be begin to build and explore the new dimensions of a relationship. Egypt should, for example, play a central role in the Middle East. It should be a key pillar in the American association with the Middle East. Uh, so I'm hardly despairing, but the game isn't over, and we're going to have to stay busily engaged with the Egyptians, maintaining our points of leverage and influence, not walking away from them, not tearing up our aid agreements, as voices in Congress have called for, but staying committed to building a relationship a relationship protects us. It also protects our diplomats in our embassies in the region. The game's afoot. Now, I know you uh, have been closely observing the situation with Israel, Iran, the United States. Uh, where do we stand there? Well, I think we're in a very dangerous passage. I know how concerned my government, Washington, is with the prospect of Israeli military action. And I'm concerned. I think we all should be concerned. I think it's a, a very, very serious, serious problem. Um, but America's relationship to this problem and to Iran is more, more than simply the nuclear question or indeed its ties to Israel. We have a responsibility to get it right with the question of Iran for Iran is a central factor in the life of the region. It can't just be ignored. Iran affects what happens in Afghanistan. Iran affects what happens in Syria. Iran affects what happens in the Gulf. Iran affects the future stability of our friends along the Gulf area, including Saudi Arabia. Iran affects what happens in Israel. You've got to be able to find and seek a live-and-let-live live approach with Iran in this region 
It's not, I win, you lose. It's finding a modus vivendi. And that, I think, is a core challenge for American diplomacy that we have yet to come to terms with. For 30 years, we've been isolated from Iran. Now we've got a task in front of us if we're going to avoid a war to figure out what the Iranian agenda is, to match that agenda while respecting the very strong red lines we have, including the defense of the State of Israel. Well, on that note, uh, which is a good note, uh, we have to wrap up. This has been just marvelous. And uh, Frank Wisner, thank you for coming by. Thanks, Jim. I have a question for you. Will American foreign policy be influenced by domestic political considerations? <laughs> it always is. Always is. Always is. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. For the digital age, I'm Jim Zirin. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. Good night and all the best.